Welcome to ACC Nation. That's Will Oginen. I'm Jim Quist, and our special guest from Big Underdog talking about bracketology is Jason Carmelo. Thanks for joining us, Jason. Jim William, thanks for having me. Let's take a look at what bracketology is all about, Jason. Um, we, we were talking before we got onto the program about what's what is bracketology? Let's let's give uh, people a, a, a 101 course in what is bracketology. What what are quadrants and, and things like that, and why they're important, and how it can all kind of add up to uh, how you're seated, etc. We'll give them a quick look at that, and then we'll move into some serious talk about who's seated one and on down the line. Great question, Jim. So we're at the time of year, right? We finally. We finally have met March, and so we're the time of year when March Madness becomes the focus in the in the sports realm. And within uh, the March Madness and the and the brackets is like you mentioned bracketology. So with that bracketology, and everybody sees Joe Lenardi on television. Um, he has been kind of the figurehead of it. But basically, what bracketology is, it's the it's the projection of teams and how they would be seeded for the NCAA basketball tournament. So there are seeds one through 16 with the, the best teams being the one seed and the, and the uh, teams with the poorer records from the smaller conferences typically being the 16 seeds and they're seeded uh, for literally from one through 16. And it started kind of with a lot of people doing this, you know, in their basements, right. And we all kind of crunch numbers and then, um, it, Joe Lenardi became the most famous being on ESPN, Jerry Palm on CBS sports, but a lot of incredibly talented people spend a lot of time on this and through, you know, forums like Twitter or podcasts, we're able to kind of disseminate the information. And what's really interesting is that there are some incredibly accurate people that study this literally 24 seven for 365. They, they crunch the numbers, they crunch the analytics. And so it really, it's a projection ranking system and it can start in November and it goes all the way up until selection Sunday. But by the but truthfully, in the end, you it's just like a like a college course, you're great on your final grade. And it is the how the teams are actually seated for that NCAA tournament and how you do versus uh, versus the selection committee is, is how you're judged. So, you know, we're talking about stats here. But is there anything else that's subjective? that's going into the final number? I, I, I think so. You know, one of the things that's hard to quantify is player injuries, right? Um, players getting hurt, players do with COVID. There's, there's that focus. Um, there's also, as they used to call it, the eye test, right? So th there are certain teams, and I think Duke is one of those teams. When you watch Duke and when they're really focused, you say to yourself, whoa, this team this team can really play and they might be the most talented team in the country, but you take a step back and, you know, you say, how did they lose to Florida state? And, you know, how did they lose to Virginia at home? So there is some subjectivity to it. I think it's a blend. The committee, the committee does say they, they crunch the numbers. They look at the analytics and I'm sure there is some eye tests involved as well. Interesting. Um, I think anybody who watches selection committee, uh, Sunday or any other day that they're, they're making selections has a feel that maybe there's some sway there based upon how teams bring in uh, fans and, and other things like that, how they do with, with television. And I know that doesn't have anything to do with bracketology specifically, but uh, Will's going to get into some questions with you here in just a second. And, and among those, that uh, I want people to make sure that they listen carefully here. Jason will sort of uh, touch base here a little bit on, on why it's important that a team be four instead of five and on down the line and how that can, can impact things. Will, you've got some questions. Yeah, one, one before we get into the nitty gritty. So what kind of fueled your passion for doing this? Sure. So um, I, I grew up, uh, grew up in Ohio and both of my parents were actually basketball coaches. Okay. I actually met, um, coaching basketball. So, you know, we didn't spend a lot of time watching Disney movies. My dad was teaching me, you know, a one, three, one trap and a two, three zone, uh, mm -hmm. growing up as a kid, which was kind of fun. So, um, I think, I think what really drew me to the bracketology part of basketball and collegiate basketball is it really is a blend between watching the games and then having a database of analytics, we'll get in the, the quadrant 
wins. We'll get into that in a few moments. You know, there's so many analytical numbers that appear on what they call the team sheets, right? On the sheets of paper that the committee evaluates that it's not just completely subjective. And so many teams are involved. There's 358 college teams that are eligible to make it and 68 are able to make the tournament, right? As opposed to with the college football playoff, there are teams that start the season that no matter what they do, they go 12 or 13 and 0, they're just not gonna be able to get to the playoff. And what makes it really special is a George Mason is an 11 seed making the final four. And those types of Cinderella runs that allow schools across the board to make it and to be evaluated fairly based on the metrics and the, and the analytics. Okay. So let's get into it a little bit here. Uh, right now, as we record this on March 1st, your number one seeds are Gonzaga, Kansas, Baylor, and Arizona. But I also think that between now and uh, and uh, when the the bracket drops in a in a couple of weeks, that there are other teams, the teams on this two line, especially the the two SEC teams, Auburn and Kentucky, and and even Duke to an extent, have shots uh, at one seed. So, are any of those? Uh, how how close is it right now between all those teams and the one line? Absolutely. So we're I think to help to help with really the discussion because you're going to hear a lot of quad one quad two conversations. So to answer your question, Will, I think I'm, I'll back up just a touch. So the, the, the overarching metric that is used, and you'll see that number from now through Selection Sunday, is what they call the net ranking. Now, the net ranking is a, is a ranking that the NCAA has created to try to go across the board and to fairly evaluate the teams. Whether you're in the ACC, the Mountain West Conference, no matter what conference you're in, they use the same ranking system. And to evaluate a good, good loss versus a bad loss or a good win versus a, a, you know, a, you know, a poor win, they created a quadrant system. So there's four quads. If you hear something called a quad one, that's a, that is a good win or it's an acceptable loss. So home and away where the game takes place matters as well. And not to get too far in the weeds, but for example, a quad one win would be a win against a top 30 team at home or if you play them on a neutral court it's a top 50 or if it's on the road top 75 right so the location of it matters so just big picture if you hear quad one that's good and you get basically double the amount of teams you can beat if you're on the road so to, to answer your question in terms of the one seats i think gonzaga is locked in i think even if they get beat in the west coast conference they're going to be a one seed They've got the body of work um, and, you know, now they have, and they have the, you know, uh, the wins in recent years to back up that they, that they are the quality program. And I, I do think that matters. So the Zags are locked up as a one where it gets really interesting is, you know, the big 12 from analytics, or even if you watch those games, the big 12 is the best conference this year in college basketball. Um, Kansas and Baylor are fighting it out for the regular season title. And it used to be that the committee really, really heavily weighed on who won the regular season, who won the conference tournament, and that was it. But because of the quadrant system, you have a team like Baylor who had, you know, their, their 12th in strength of schedule out of 358. And they have, they lead the nation with 12 quad one wins and Kansas has 10. And that's really more than anybody else in the country other than Wisconsin has 10 as well. So you have two teams in the same conference because it's so good beating, beating up on other teams. It's hard. It's hard right now to not have them in in Arizona, you know, 25 and three, you know, only five quad one wins, which is what Duke has. I think Arizona is the team that is kind of on upset alert and you could absolutely see them sliding down. And, and, Typically, the committee has started to – they spread out the one seeds. When it, when it gets to Selection Sunday, Sunday, they spread the one seeds out. They like to give teams that win the regular season and their conference tournament, which could happen with Duke, which could, could happen with an Illinois or Purdue or Wisconsin. They like to give them the one seeds. And so I think Arizona could slide. Kentucky, who is just now starting to get back, Ty Ty Washington and Wheeler, their guards, they could slide up to the one seed fully healthy. Auburn is not playing as well as they have been all year. You know, you could absolutely see Big 12 get one, whether it's Kansas or Baylor, and someone take Arizona's spot. So Kentucky and Duke, the Blue Bloods could absolutely end up being one seeds, yes. 
Yeah, I, I I tend to think that by the end the end of it, as long as they're healthy, Kentucky will end up sliding up to the the one line. I think they're playing they're playing like the best team in basketball right now. Um, down a little bit, I want to get into this discussion, and we talked about this before we started. Is the difference between the four seed and the five seed in the win percentage? Um, can you expound on that for those of for uh, for the listeners? Absolutely. So selection Sunday comes, you hear your teams. You know, uh, your team get called out. You know, Greg Gumbel yells it out and everybody's pumped. And you take a deep breath and you realize who they're playing. And there is so much historical data now that it used to be a 64 team field, now 68. But there's plenty of data now that goes back to what's your seed and does it really matter? And in some ways tonight, what I'm trying to do is give a little calm to the ACC fans that, mm-hmm. listen, an, a, a nine seed's okay. Um, and, a, and a 10 seed's probably okay too. So, Walking through it, the biggest difference in, in all of it, though, is the difference, as you said, well, between the four and the five. So if you're a one or a two seed, you have a, somewhere between a 99 to 94 percent chance of winning. Right. One and two seeds. Yes. Now, there's always an Oral Roberts upset. But but yes. The difference between a four seed is 80 percent win rate versus a five seed. It's 65 percent. Right. So you've got a 15 percent difference in winning percentage over the last 25 years which really adds up, right? That is a one that someone, that's someone getting knocked off per, per year. And so when you, when you, when you see that threshold, you really want to get inside the top four and that really gets you into the, into the second round. Another interesting note, you see the eight, nine games and really the only difference between an eight, nine game is who wears the light and the dark jerseys. That's it. Because the nine seeds have actually won 51% of the time over 40, you know, 49, the other way. Uh, being the eight seed. So nine and eight doesn't necessarily matter. Seven, 10 is a 60, 40 split, right? Seven, the seven seed uh, has a 60%, the, the 10 seed 40, but you go to an 11 seed, it's only, you know, 37%. So long story short, once you get past, once you get past that, that eight range, you're, these games are around 50, 50 games, even the six, 11 games in recent years, it's just a shade over 50, 50. The teams are so the teams are so tightly knit. The difference between a six seed and 11 seed, when you really scrub the numbers and the analytical data is really just a couple of quad one or quad two wins. And I'm trying to think off the top of my head here. And generally since this uh, playing game, the, uh, the, at the at large playing game, I think every, just about everyone who's, you know, want, you've been in that has won a uh, game in the first round. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I yeah. think that's the case. Yes. You saw VCU years ago have a lot of success. And last year, it, you know, it was really interesting. UCLA at times last year was you know, borderline you know, unwatchable offensively, mm-hmm. right? They really struggled offensively. Cronin's a fantastic coach. He got them to buy in. And over time, they always guard. They always play hard. Over time, they started to score. Juzang got more comfortable at UCLA. And, you know, they were down six points with four or five minutes to go against Michigan State in the playing game last year. They survived that in Dayton, and then they pushed all the way to the Final Four. And now their program trajectory has changed for the next 10 years because of that that run. So, Will, you're right. Teams, it's almost like, especially when you have players that haven't been in the NCAA tournament, if they can just get that one win under their belt, get their feet on the ground, they can really get going. Whereas – they're not playing with the type of pressure in the first game of the season that some of the higher seeds have been playing with. So, so get going down to the, that 12 seed range and we've uh, and we've established that there's generally one of these every year. Um, I'm looking at the ones, at least not the Atlar, but a couple of teams that stand out. Um, Iona, obviously there, you know, Rick Patino's the head coach there. So, you know, he's, his team is going to be ready to play. But one of the uh, intriguing teams I see on the on that twelve line is North Texas. Yep. So people don't realize this. They obviously, you're you're not going to watch a whole lot of North Texas basketball. As we record this on March first, they have overtaken Virginia as the slowest team in the country. That is that is I did not think anything was possible. But this is a team that has played really well. They've only had one double digit loss and that is to Kansas who you have on the one line. Now uh, these two, so what do you look at, at the, at these teams as potential like 12, five upsets Are those two that you, you would look at and say, yeah, these, these could easily pull off upsets and yeah, maybe well, even win two games. Well, that's a great point. I mean, North Texas from a net standpoint, which is the ranking system is a spot or two ahead of North Carolina. 
and we're now in March. So that's kind of a crazy statistic. The, the reason why North Texas is so dangerous on the 12 line is, is they're a top 25 team in three point makes. And when you play these teams in the tournament and they just keep firing away threes, they can be really dangerous. You saw that with Oral Roberts over Ohio State in a 215 game last year. They could really they spread it, they spread the floor, they take away the physicality. And they if they if they're making threes that day, if they get you know eight to ten three made, you know, they're gonna win the game. Um, and the other thing about North Texas is they're a top 20 national defense. And and against the and they guard the three-pointer, they're top 10 guarding the three-point. So they, they're a very dangerous team. Uh, they're very hot right now. I mean, they've won they won 13 in a row. So, you know, they're, they're, they're in a really good spot. Again, Iona, you mentioned, they have Patino, right? They, they were beat last year in the NCAA tournament by Alabama. Then they got him in Florida, the Disney shootout in November. Patino got, his, got it ready. And, you know, he beat Alabama. He wasn't able to get Kansas in that tournament, but uh, he did beat Bama, which puts him on the radar for not large, but it's going to be close. I, in terms of teams and rooting interest in, in, in stealing at large bids, if you're an ACC fan, the one team that is going to be a lock from a smaller conference, the Ohio Valley Conference, is Murray State. Murray State is going to the tournament. So when you start to watch conference tournaments and say, you know, if you're if you're a Notre Dame fan or especially a Wake Forest fan or Carolina fan, you want Murray State to win because if they don't, Murray State's getting in, and they're and someone else just took one of the at large spots. Some reason I, I just envisioned everybody at Murray State jumping out of their chairs and and yelling when you said that uh hey when we were promoting jason uh to to be on the show we talked about uh the possibility of squeezing the acc lemon to make some lemonade and we're going to talk about that in just a second but the first thing we're going to do we're going to give um and i'd be remiss if i did not do this and you would be too jason we need to give credit to the artists who uh, have the art behind you and <laughs> folks, you need to watch us on YouTube in order to see what we're talking about. Uh, Jason, if you would explain and, and a tip of the hat to those artists who provided you with your background. Oh yeah. So uh, over the last gosh, almost two years now, my daughter, Gianna, uh, she's five and uh, my son, Felix, who's eight. We spent a lot of time in the morning before uh, we were homeschooling them. Uh, drawing Disney cartoons, anything we can think of, Iron Man back there. So um, they made sure that it's in every Zoom call I've had in the last two years. So they're really proud of it and they should be. So they're they're fantastic and we got a lot of quality time with them. So that that's my background. I'm not, you know, not going to change it. So we're uh we'll let the whole world enjoy it now. That's right. That's right. And I'm I'm glad you you gave them uh, some credit. I know they'll enjoy that. Um, Let's let's get into the ACC and see if we can make some lemonade here. You've got uh, uh, several teams uh, out of the ACC, Duke, UNC, Virginia Tech, Wake Forest, Notre Dame, Miami. Um, all of these teams possibly in some more so than others. Uh, I mean, we were talking about the net earlier. Duke is number nine in the latest NCAA net rankings. But then we have to go a long way to find anybody else. And the next team up is uh, North Carolina at 39, Virginia Tech at 40, Wake Forest at 42, Notre Dame at 46, Miami at 62. Yep. That's not the best resume that the ACC has, has had in quite a while. Let's, let's, uh, let's talk about the teams, and we'll start with Duke, and, um, and then we'll work our way to, to teams that you think maybe won't be drinking lemonade <laughs> so over the last five years the acc has earned an average of eight bids a year so out of the 68 teams they get eight of them in some years it's even you know um, in eight in 2017 and 2018 they actually had nine teams if you remember they were having the, the committee was having a hard time bracketing them because they're running into each other in the second round of the tournament so typically you've got eight teams slotted in this year. I think if everything breaks well, they're probably looking at five teams. Um, if I just, the path on more than five is going to be really difficult. And you mentioned Duke. 
they're the, obviously they're the lock. They're, they're pushing for one seed. Um, what makes do have a chance at that one line is their November wins over Gonzaga and Kentucky. Right? That gives them a chance. They've got four losses on the year by a total of nine points. So they're playing close games. They've got a chance to push to the one. Um, you know, they've got a couple players that are borderline all Americans. They've got eight and two road record. So they're there in second in the pecking order, I, I believe is Miami. And when you're, when you're looking at the difference between North Carolina, Notre Dame, Miami, and Wake, the difference between them is so fine. But the reason why I think Miami is the safest of those four teams and really the second in the pecking order of the ACC is quality wins. When the NCAA tournament committee, they did a bracket reveal show about two weeks ago. So they came out and they said, the, as of now, it was kind of a, you know, made for TV purposes, which was great for us bracketologists. Hey, these are the top 16 teams at the time. And the main thing that they discussed that day, and in fact, why Baylor at the time, Baylor wasn't playing as well. If you remember, they had some people hurt and they had, they had had two losses in three games. They said Baylor, no matter what, is still the fifth best team in the country because at the time they had nine quad one wins. They were very steadfast on this is the team and this is the quad one win. Same thing with Illinois. And Miami has four quad one wins or four top tier wins versus one for Carolina, two for Notre Dame, and one for Wake. And they have three quadrant one, three quadrant three losses. But I think their wins over Duke, North Texas, who we talked about, and then at Virginia Tech and Wake give them a chance. Plus, with Miami, they're eight and two on the road, which is a fantastic road record and, and one that's very, very rare. Most teams at this stage of the year are five and four on the road, you know, maybe, maybe six and three. An eight and two record, record's really, really good. They're a very good offensive team. They don't turn the ball over where they can get in trouble is at, at, at times they are not, they, they don't guard the way in which a lot of these other teams in the ACC guard. You know, they're 324th out of 358 in opponent's field goal percentage. So teams are getting good looks. They're knocking them in, and, and Miami's got to go the other way and, and get baskets. And I guess the, the last part about Miami, when you look at the numbers and the metrics, it's really interesting. The computer numbers break, are really broken into two parts. There's resultant base metrics, going down the rabbit hole now, but there's resultant base metrics, which is the games have been played, and this is, this is what you've done. And then there are predictive metrics, which are you your percentages of stops on defense or offense and basically efficiency trends, right? So th the game results think that they're the 41st best team in the country. But their analytics in terms of efficiencies, because their defense is so bad, has them 65th. So it's a 24-team gap. And I believe the committee is going to lean more towards that 41, that 41 because of the, the four quality wins. And, you know, there's 16 and six in that last 22. And certainly a team that, that started out really hot, but they also kind of, it appears that they flamed out as the season progressed. I think they got some of those big wins when it really counted, but uh, um you know, when it comes down to press and, and getting exposure, and this is something that we talked about with uh, uh, Joshua about Notre Dame uh, in the last podcast about how you don't get enough recognition. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're sort of off the, the radar. Miami just sort of slid off the radar here. And what you just did is put them back there. Yeah. Uh, explaining why uh, they're going to be, a team that, that should be picked and, and probably be in that field of 68. Yeah. Um, I, I think Miami is, is the safest of the four, as we call bubble, right. For everybody listening, right. if you hear the term bubble at this time of year, and you're going to hear it a lot, bubble means a team may or may not make it. They're kind of on the cusp of being able to make the tournament. And I think Miami is the safest of the four bubble teams, Carolina, Notre Dame, Miami and Wake. So who's next in that in that lineup uh, that that you would pick? And I know you just threw out uh, two wins in that quad one for Notre Dame. You got it, Notre Dame. You got it, Jim. Notre Dame. Um, Notre Dame is hanging their hat on the early season win against Kentucky, and that's okay. You know, they started they started this season. They were three and four, and you know people were talking about you know Bray doesn't have it anymore. Notre Dame has really slipped it off the radar. 
They're just not able to score like they used to. Kentucky came to town and bam, their season changed. They got the win over Notre Dame. Their other, the other quadrant one win is a, is a, a road win against Miami. They've got quad two wins over Carolina, Clemson, and, and, and Louisville. What makes Notre Dame a, a, a unique instance this year is, is their defense is a little bit better. Um, typically, their defense over the last, even when even they've been successful the last five years, their defense was around 100th in the country. And, and that's what's always made it a little tough to make a Final Four, to play, to play really good defensive games four times in a row. This year, they're in the 60s. And so they're guarding a little better. And, and they're a top 30 offense, as they always are. They're a top 33-point shooting team, as they always are. Um, again, if you start the season four and five and you win 17 out of the last 20 in the ACC, you're going to be in a really good spot to make the tournament. Let me, let me ask you about Wake Forest then, because I think this is a team that you know, they have you know exceeded expectations of many this year. And you, you right now have them in the playing game. I know you'd mentioned that they only have the one quad one win, but does a lot of that have to do with uh, their non-conference just not having much substance to it? Yes, Will, you're spot on. The, the committee has been very clear in recent years that who did you beat and who did you play, specifically in the non-conference, because – Teams control, teams and their athletic directors control their non-conference strength of schedule. And there's 358 teams out there in Division I. They are 336 in non-conference strength of schedule. And so if you pair 336 with one quadrant one win, and it's a win like at Virginia Tech, right, who, who likely will not make the tournament or will be on the bubble and maybe, maybe be able to slide in, you don't have a win necessarily against a tournament team in the quad one realm, you beat Notre Dame and, and, and UNC at home, but you don't have a quad one win of a tournament team and you have a really poor non-conference strength of schedule, it's really hard to make the tournament. I think people are fascinated and, and, and captured by the 22 and eight and the 12 and seven in the league. And that sounds better than the substance of what their resume actually is. Um, they've lost three of five and there, there's lots of historical precedents of teams that make it. If you remember in 2014, Larry Brown was coaching at SMU and SMU was ranked in the top 25 of the Associated Press the final week of the regular season. And I always tell everyone I, 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 within shouting distance, please don't look at the Associated Press and please don't look at the coaches. Well, there's so many other numbers to look at, but they were ranked in the top 25. They were 27 and seven. They had Larry Brown as a coach, but their, their strength of schedule in non-con was 315 and they didn't make the tournament. And Wake has a similar type profile. Now, they Wake absolutely has had a fantastic year, and they absolutely have a chance to get in, but they're going to have to keep winning, right? They're, they have to beat NC State at home. That is a must this week. And they're going to have to win a, a game in the conference tournament because, again, they've lost three of the last five. They can't go in, uh, you know, playing this poorly and, and still be, be expected to make the tournament when they're really when their metrics are, are this bad. The only other teams within shouting distance in the ACC are both of the Virginia schools. At this point, is it a matter of this? They're just going to have to get the auto bid to get in. The, the quad going back to the quads, right. And the quality wins, the ACC tournament is going to take place on a neutral site. So who's in the top 50. So then you get into who's in the top 50. And then you can start racking up a couple of quadrant one wins to make your profile look better. I think for, Virginia Tech, their net's 41. Um, again, they won at Miami. They've got wins over Notre Dame, Maryland, Florida State. St. Bonaventure's on the bubble as well. Their metrics are pretty good for Virginia Tech, but again, they lack kind of the quality win substance. Whereas you, you, you turn and you look at Virginia, who's only 17 and 12, right? It's only five over. As a side note, the, the committee has kind of established a threshold. You need to be four games over 500 to make the tournament. Now, they don't come out and say it. And there's always an exception to the rule. I think Oklahoma has a chance to be an exception to the rule this year if they can get three games over 500. But Virginia, Virginia has wins at Duke, and they beat a very good Providence team, um, and they swept Miami. So Virginia's not done yet. The problem with Virginia is they've got five quadrant three losses, right? So they they take the win at Duke and the Providence, and then they they get rid of it because they've lost to Navy and James Madison at home. You know, and, and the crazy thing is 
the committee used to evaluate the last 10 games more heavily than the first 10 or, you know, or the first 20. But now they're saying all the games matter the same. They all matter the same. And if that's the case, those November losses against Navy and James Madison are, are going to really, really haunt, haunt Virginia. Listen, that, that's Rutgers' problem right now. They lost to Lafayette and UMass. And even though if you beat Wisconsin and Purdue and Ohio State and Michigan and in, in the Rutgers world, they're still not able to make it. In terms of the pecking order, I, I believe – I believe Virginia Tech has the easier path because they, they simply don't have as many bad losses. Their, their metrics are a little better, but it depends, it depends who these teams play uh, working their way through the bracket. Um, both teams could get in, but if one of these teams gets in, that's bad news for a team like Wake because I just don't see six bids coming to the ACC's way because when you look at the depth of the conference, it's, you know, it's the sixth ranked conference in the country, which is a crazy thing to say about the ACC, right? The ACC is typically at minimum in the top three. So uh, how important is winning in the ACC tournament from the standpoint of getting some of these teams that are on the cusp, just, just about there? Yep. And, and how many wins are they going to have to pull off in the ACC tournament in order to, to get a nod to go to the field of 68? I think Carolina, Notre Dame, and Miami just need to win one game in the tournament. They need one game. They got to finish the week strong. Carolina does not need to win at Duke. If they win, they're in, great. And that's going to be the motto of Coach K's last game at home. But the more important game, if you're a Carolina fan, is to win the first game of the ACC tournament. Right. You've just got to get that one under your belt. If you can't beat Duke at Duke, that's okay. A lot of teams don't get that win in the ACC tournament so that you avoid another bad loss. What really hurt North Carolina is they were hanging their hat on. We're only one in seven in quad one, but we don't have any bad losses. Well, then they got tripped up by Pitt, who's now fallen back to a quadrant four loss, which is one of the worst losses you can have in the country. So they cannot afford to get tripped to a Pitt you know, or Louisville this year, they've really got to, they got to do that again, Notre Dame, Miami, um, and UNC just get one more win. I think wake wake needs to beat NC state at home. And then they may need two. they may need two games. Now, again, these teams probably going to run into each other when you get to that second round. Okay. Back to me for sir. I've got a couple more teams I want to ask you about. And this is, this is mostly just because people don't necessarily follow these teams, but you have them higher up on, and bracketology than you would normally see them in higher years. And, and the first one I want to mention is one you talked about earlier, and that's Murray State. They, you, know, they, you mentioned that they're a team that will, if they some for some reason uh, slip up in their conference tournament, will get will likely get an at-large resume. So tell people about Murray State for those who aren't familiar with them this year. Sure. So, you know, everybody thinks Murray State, they think of John Morant, right? Mm -hmm. A few years ago, he was fantastic and the guard play was fantastic. This year, they're, they're slightly different. They're less focused on the perimeter. They're more focused inside um, and they're a fantastic rebounding team. They're the 13th best offensive rebounding team in the country. They are, they're really, really skilled and, and good offensively. Um, and they're balanced defensively as well. They're, they're, they're 26 in the nation uh, in defensive efficiency. They've gotten to play a, a couple teams at a couple teams during the season to get um, to get a higher level of competition, which I think is really important for these teams. That's what listen, that's what Oral Roberts did last year. They played Oklahoma State, they played Tulsa, they played Kansas State. This year, a team like Murray State, they knew they had a pretty good team. They went out, they scheduled Auburn. Auburn got them by 13. Um, they beat Memphis by by a basket. They've played some of these teams. Chattanooga is a really good team too, uh, who they beat. They have played some of these teams who have had major success. And I think Memphis is going to find their way to get in the tournament. And they built confidence early in the year that they can play with an Auburn and a Memphis. And then they've just rattled off um, in, in their conference. Again, they, you know, they've, they've won what 16 in a row. So I'm going to kind of combine my last couple questions into one here. And this is another team that if you don't, if you don't stay up to watch West coast basketball, you're not going to be super familiar with them. And that's St. Mary's. Okay. St. Mary's finished second in the WCC this year. If you paid attention, they just went and beat Gonzaga, your top overall seed over the weekend. 
So for those who aren't familiar with St. Mary's, can you just kind of give a little info about them? And then as a, as a whole, the WCC was much better this, this year than, than, uh, than normal. So just explain how, how good the WCC was this year as well. Sure. So typically the West Coast Conference, as you stated, Will, is Gonzaga and St. Mary's is around, you know, that 10 line. And then maybe BYU since BYU is coming to that conference in recent years. And this year, it's really opened up, and a team like San Francisco, a really well-coached team like San Francisco, has, has joined the party. To focus on St. Mary's, Will, St. Mary's typically, and they have a lot of, they've had a lot of Australian players come over. Um, they've really recruited that market well. Typically, St. Mary's is a top 50 offense. They score, and they go, and they go, and they go. But their talent this year has been a little, they're a little bigger and they don't really play at that same tempo. Um, their tempo is, you know, 336 out of 358. So they play at a slower pace, a bit like Virginia fans, right? Which is okay. Wisconsin plays the same way. And you win a lot of basketball games controlling tempo. What makes St. Mary's really strong this year is their defense. They're a top 10 defense. Um, they're the sixth best defensive rebounding team in the country. They really guard. They really rebound. It's one and done. That's what you saw the other night. They were big enough and physical enough to body up Holmgren and Timmy inside. And it was one and done for Gonzaga. A miss. St. Mary's went the other way. They had the crowd going. They made enough threes and they were able to really be successful. Um, I think, you know, BYU has, has, has you know, uh, four or five quad one wins, depending on the day one goes back and forth. San Francisco is the team that's going to be really on the cusp. They've had a wonderful season. I think they're going to need a win or two in the West Coast Conference tournament uh, to get in. But but yeah, the, the Mountain West and the West Coast Conference have had a resurgence. Both have had a resurgence this year. And in some ways, they're gobbling up the bids that the AC, the three or four bids the ACC typically has that, that aren't getting. What's crazy is, is that we're here in March and we're talking about a North Carolina team who's 22 and 8, 14 and 5 in the ACC. And may not make the tournament. Listen, I think they get in, but the fact that a 22 and eight Carolina team and a 14 and five in the ACC is on the bubble is, is crazy, right? Typically a, a Carolina team is 22 and eight. We're talking about probably around that four line, right? Maybe three with a push in the tournament, they could beat Duke or maybe fall back to a five, but we're talking about where they're playing, right? Can they play in Greensboro? All those types of things at 22 and eight. And so it's a really, really unique year. And I, listen, I think people are really hard on the ACC and maybe the, the, the depth isn't there. One, because Louisville, Syracuse, and Florida State are, are, are worse than they've been in the last 10 years. But that doesn't mean a team like Duke can't win the national title. And it doesn't mean a team like Notre Dame, who has some really, you know, Love and Baycock are really good basketball players. They, they can absolutely make a Sweet 16, if not an Elite Eight. And once you get there, why not, right? So Carolina absolutely has a chance to make a run. Notre Dame has a chance to scare people because they can really shoot the ball. Miami's very good offensively as well. And, you know, Wake has a toughness about them that if they could just find their way in, they're going to play with energy because it's a really big deal that they've made it. Wake could be absolutely be one of those teams that, you know, they make the first four and, and get a win or two. And really for Wake, this year is a building block for their program if they can get some success, that's really going to resonate, resonate, you know, their program into recruiting. One of the things I think that the, you know, why a lot of people are, are kind of dissing on the ACC this year is, is quite simply, we're kind of self-proclaimed as the basketball conference. So when you do that, you put a target on yourself, sure. right? And mm -hmm. everybody comes after you. And then when you don't perform, everybody's there rooting against you. So that's, that's part of it. Won't last. Trust me on that. It's the, this year, it's the anomaly. Next year, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bank on anything being like it is this year. Um, just to be a little bit of a homer, Jason. Sure. <laughs> so, sure. Hey, uh, one thing that, that I want to ask you, and maybe Will wants some of this action as well. So when it comes down to us, um, you know, making our selections for our bracket, uh, can, can we like, you know, like give me a call and <laughs> get a little help? Absolutely. Um, 
the numbers I crunch and the hours that I spend doing this, you would think that I've had any success with filling out the brackets. But the, the problem is, you know, we talk about bracketology. The problem is when you when you go over these and you pour over these numbers and you and you see teams a certain way, you build up a certain view of a team, right? And you and then you hold that against them. If you believe a team is a nine seed and they get seeded as a six, you hold that against them. And then you pick against them. And no matter what, then they end up making the final four. So I, uh, I, you can have all of my data in my team sheets and you can have my, uh, my picks, but you, you may not want to use them come mid-March. So. <laughs> well, here's a suggestion for people who, uh, who should be following you. Number one, uh, go to Twitter and follow Jason at uh, uh, Big Underdog Blog. That's at Big Underdog Blog. All right. Make sure that she let's let's build up some numbers here for for Jason from, you know, all the ACC people who are going, eh, OK, this this is the guy to, to watch. And there's a really good reason. Maybe Will will throw that in here uh, and tell us why he's, there's a good reason. To- well, yeah, I can do that real quick. Um, If you look at bracket matrix and the in bracket, if you're not familiar with what bracket matrix is. It ranks all the bracketologists. Um, I think there is well over 130, 150. I don't remember the exact n- number, but Jason is like ranked in the top like 30 to 35 of all bracketologists. So he's his numbers are higher than Lenardi and Jerry Palm. So he's he's got them dusted by a good 20. Sp- I think he's got Lenardi by some 20 spots and 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 palm by a good 70 hello <laughs> well I, I i sincerely uh i sincerely appreciate that it it's uh it's a lot of fun and you know a lot of us take it really really seriously and like you said will like lenardi and palm get a lot of the headlines there's a lot of fantastic people whether it's on twitter or the websites doing this and i think this is a really the next week or two for acc fans really want to follow people that are really diving into it because we can help kind of try to relieve some stress in your life. And it's not the end of the world if you're eight or nine, right? As long as you get in. Um, and it, it depends on the matchup when you get there. And uh, I, I think I think some of these teams are a little safer uh, than people are perceiving them to be. I'm just a little nervous about Wake, so. Yeah. And also you want to follow uh, the, the website, make sure that you uh, you mark this and in, in, uh, favorite it. Big-underdog.com. Got that big? hyphen underdog.com like i said follow uh, jason on twitter and also favorite the website you want to keep up to date on what's going on uh, bracket wise this is the man to talk to and to watch and to follow is, that's why we're doing it that's why we have jason on uh because we want to know what's going on and whether or not we were going to get any lemonade <laughs> I, just how much I, sugar was going to be thrown in it's a little little on the tart side right now jason <laughs> it's all, <laughs> all uh, don't say. don't don't give up yet there's a lot of good players in the acc like i said duke there's no reason why duke can't get to the final four and carolina's got some really good players they shoot a lot of threes they start making some of those get some confidence second weekends absolutely with insight Jason Carmelo, big underdog, uh, bracketologist. And thank you, sir, for joining us and, and talking to us and setting us straight and give us some inside scoop on what's going on with college basketball. Jim, well, thank you guys so much. It was a lot of fun. <laughs>